Well, t- we're still in our parable series, and today we're going to be talking about forgiveness. So let me start out by asking you a question that I really think I already know the answer to. But has anyone here ever had a problem with people? Anybody here ever had a problem with people? Like I say, I know the answer to that question. I'm actually convinced that life would be a whole lot easier without people. Amen? I mean, let's be honest. We hurt each other all the time. And we see it in our world everywhere you look, and I think it's getting worse by the minute. Uh, I saw it in my son Austin when he was only seven years old, probably earlier than that, but I remember when he was about seven, he went outside to play with his cousin Chad, and they went out to the barn, and they uh, grabbed some broomsticks, and they were uh, uh, having sword fights, you know, pretending they were sword fights or a lightsaber or something, and I was in charge of babysitting the boys, and I thought, well, this will keep them busy for a while. They're just having fun, making all these sound effects, and so I went back in the house. Well, they were having fun for about 20 minutes. I came back out, and they were beating, their, uh, them, beating each other over the head with their lightsabers. I'll just say that. And I was hoping that my son, being the preacher's kid, would have probably uh, uh, been uh, bringing some peace into the situation, right? Uh, I was hoping that maybe he would pull out his Bible and pray over the situation. No, that didn't happen. He was so mad at Chad. I'll still remember his face was so red. He was so mad at Chad because Chad had hit his lightsaber and knocked it out of Austin's hand. So Austin, right when I'm coming out, he had picked up a handful of gravel and he just threw it at Chad. What's the moral of that story? Cheryl didn't let me babysit anymore. No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) The real moral of the story, my point is, no matter how close you are to someone, we still hurt each other. Uh, Family members hurt each other. Friends hurt each other. Matter of fact, we've all been hurt by people, amen? Every one of us has been hurt somewhere along the line by people and maybe many times by people. Uh, Some are small things, some are huge things. I heard about a huge thing that actually happened, true story, on December 1st, 1997. About a dozen students were gathered together for a daily prayer meeting at Heath High School in Paducah, Kentucky. And as they said their final amen, amen, a 14-year-old boy suddenly walked into that room with a gun, opened fire, killed three students, and wounded uh, five others seriously. But the irony of the whole situation was that these kids, this prayer group, had actually befriended this young man that came in with that gun. But in the middle of this tragedy, an amazing story of forgiveness emerged, As she lay in the hospital, one of the injured girls, 15-year-old, her name was Melissa Jenkins, was informed that she would likely, most likely, be a paraplegic for the rest of her life. Melissa wanted to convey a message to this young man that shot her. Can you imagine what that message might be if it were you? Can you imagine what she might have said? Did she say she hated him? Did she say, I hope you get yours in the end? No, not at all. What she said, this teenage Christian girl said, I forgive you. Let me tell you, only a Christian could do that. Because it's not a natural thing to do, it's a supernatural thing to do. And I'd say that's one of the most amazing things about being a true follower of Christ. Because within us, we have the capacity to forgive others. No matter how bad that atrocity may seem. And if we call ourselves Christ followers and we are to imitate Christ, right? If we call ourselves Christ followers and we're to imitate Christ, then we are to forgive when we have been hurt. I'm not saying it's easy, but we are to forgive when we've been hurt. In church, we talk a whole lot. I talk a whole lot about forgiveness throughout the year. And I think the biggest reason is because we, even as Christians, struggle with this. We have a problem doing it. We have a problem offering forgiveness. And maybe it is because we live in a world that's full of people, and people can hurt you, and they do every day. But what's our temptation? Our temptation is to hold on to that hurt. Our temptation is to internalize that hurt, to hold on to that injury or that hurt, and to hold a grudge, right? And many of us let it fester so much it turns into a bitterness. So let me ask you today, how long has it been since someone has even hurt your feelings? How long has it been since someone ripped you off? Maybe they stole from you. Maybe they slandered you or gossiped about you. How long has it been? 
Or maybe they just plain outright offended you. So my question today is, who has hurt you? Or who is hurting you right now? Think about that question. Some of you already have a picture of somebody on your mind. But maybe it's not something that happened real recently. Maybe it happened back when you were a kid. Maybe it's words you heard growing up, like you're too fat, you're too dumb, you're not pretty enough, you're not smart enough, and it hurt back then, and if you're honest, it's still hurting today. Maybe it's the words that your ex-spouse said to you, and maybe that was years ago. But to you, it still, still seems like yesterday, and those words still hurt. Maybe it's the words that your current spouse doesn't say to you his or her silence uh, speaks volumes speaks so much louder than words and those non-words even hurt the whole point i'm trying to make the fact is people hurt people people hurt people philip yancey in his book called what's so amazing about grace says this he says unforgiveness is sadly our natural human state we nurse sores we go to elaborate lengths to rationalize our behavior We perpetuate family feuds, we punish ourselves, we punish others, all to avoid the most unnatural act of forgiving. I would say that uh, Mr. Yancey is right, because forgiveness is not a natural thing to do. And in our society, I'll say this, real forgiveness, when it comes down to it, is pretty rare. You know, we've all heard people say, I forgive you, right? We've all heard people say, well, I'm burying the hatchet. I guarantee you if they buried the hatchet, they put a map to know exactly where that hatchet was so they can go back and they can dig it up uh, when they need it. Amen? I think when we say we forgive a lot of times, all we're doing is we're putting our resentment in cold storage so that we can actually go thaw it out when we need it. That's a good time to say amen. Because you know what? We all do it. We've all seen it done. We've all had it done to us. So what do you do when people hurt you? This is actually a question that Peter asked Jesus in Matthew chapter 18. And Jesus' answer is incredibly simple, but I'll say it's incredibly difficult because you know what Jesus told Peter? Well, you forgive, and then you forgive, and then you forgive, and then guess what? You forgive some more. Incredibly simple, but incredibly difficult. We're going to actually get into that in a minute, but before we get into what forgiveness is, how about we look at what forgiveness is not? Because I think a lot of times we get this wrong, and when we get it wrong, guess what happens? It messes us up. Uh, First of all, forgiveness is not forgetting. Do you realize that? Forgiveness is not forgetting. Many times people will say, and we've heard the old saying, just forgive and forget, right? You know, a lot of times, and I'd say most times, that really isn't possible When somebody hurts us so deeply, we can't just uh, throw it out of our minds. It's not so easy just to forget about. We don't have that ability. I would go as far as to say deep wounds and deep hurts take a long time to heal. Amen? Some of you know that firsthand. You're still carrying some things that happened maybe years ago. Uh, Clara Barton. We've all heard of Clara Barton, the founder of the American Red Cross. She was once reminded of something mean that had happened to her years before, uh, but she acted as if she had never even heard of the incident. One of her friends came by and said, "Uh, don't you remember that? No, she said. In fact, I distinctly remember forgetting it. Think about that. I distinctly remember forgetting it. The second thing is forgiveness is not excusing. It's not excusing. It's not looking at a wrong and saying, hey, it's no big deal, when it could very well be a huge deal. Forgiveness is not being a doormat. You're not to be a doormat for anyone. It's not refusing to call someone into account for their behavior or their actions, and it's not really letting them off the hook where they never suffer any consequences. Let me just say this. In every day, we need to set up certain boundaries. Amen? We need to set those boundaries in a place that not only protects them, but protects us. And see, forgiveness doesn't always lead to reconciliation. Oh, it's a part of it, but it's not a guarantee. For example, a wife could forgive her abusive husband, but it doesn't mean she's supposed to be in a relationship with that man. Amen? Think about it. She needs to keep herself in a safe place. So when it comes down to it, what is forgiveness? I've got a simple definition. Forgiveness literally means to leave behind or to release So when we forgive, you know what we're doing? We're leaving behind an offense. 
we're leaving behind something wrong that we've suffered from someone, along with maybe and hopefully hatred and that sense to uh, want to get even. A Bible commentary I read said this word was used to describe Peter and Andrew when they left their nets and they followed Jesus. Remember that story when he was calling his disciples? It's in Matthew 4.20. It says, then they immediately left their nets and followed him. You realize they didn't forget their nets? They didn't forget their boats. They just chose on their own to leave them behind. This is so important with this topic. I'm, a topic I'm talking about of forgiveness because do you realize that forgiveness is a choice? Forgiveness is a choice. I'm not saying again that it's an easy choice, but it's a choice. And if you've chose to uh, not release an offense that somebody committed against you, if you haven't chosen to dismiss it, or if you haven't chosen to forgive them, guess what? That offense, that unforgiveness, and that person is still holding you in bondage. And that bondage can be destructive. Unforgiveness can be destructive. Some of us know that firsthand. We've had to go through what happens when we are slow to forgive someone. But I get it. The very moment we make up our mind and our heart that I'm going to forgive you, all of a sudden, a thousand excuses come out of the woodwork. Amen? I mean, why I can't do this? It's, but, but you don't know what they did to me. Or we might say, well, they lied about me over and over and over again. Or you might say, well, you can't imagine the hell that I've been through because of this. Or you don't know what this has done to my family. If you knew what it had done to my family, you'd be angry too. Or somebody might say, well, I was sexually abused, and how can I forgive that? They deserve to suffer just like they made me suffer. Well, C.S. Lewis, I think, had a word for that. Everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. Think about it. Everyone says that forgiveness is a lovely idea, a great idea, until we have something to forgive. I would say C.S. Lewis was definitely right. Amen? He was right. It's so true because forgiveness then becomes what? Difficult. It becomes hard. It becomes one of the hardest things you've ever had to do in your life. Well, in Matthew, chapter eight, uh, Matthew 18, Jesus has been talking with his disciples about relationships among believers and how you're supposed to treat believers who have sinned against you. He taught them actually to be willing to seek that person out to go restore that relationship and to forgive those brothers and sisters that have injured us or hurt us. But then Peter comes along and he asks Jesus a question. Look at Matthew 18, verse 21. Then Peter came to Jesus and asked, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? I would imagine Peter was feeling pretty good about himself. He thinks, I'm really going to impress Jesus now and stretch this forgiveness thing out seven times. And I can just see Peter probably expecting the Lord to say, are you kidding me, Peter? You're going to stretch it out to forgive seven times? Hey, let's have a round of applause for Simon Peter. I mean, way to go, Peter. And do you realize that the religious leaders back in that day, they taught that to forgive someone three times was being very generous? It was like three strikes and you're out. They thought that's as far as you should go. But I will hand it to Peter. He basically says to Jesus, Jesus, I know you want us to love people. So I'm going to double that number. I'm going to double the three. I'll make it uh, six. And then I'm going to throw in one for good measure. Seven times. That ought to be good enough, Jesus, right? And when I hear Peter say that, I'm thinking to myself, sounds pretty generous to me. Sounds pretty fair. Well, imagine somebody, maybe one of your friends, doing something to you that's unfair or uh, hurtful. Maybe they say something about, the, to, about you that's absolutely untrue to someone else. You hear about it, you confront them, they apologize, you forgive them. You feel pretty good about everything, and the next day they go out and they say the exact same thing to somebody else. You're generous, you forgive them again. But suppose they did it again and again and again, and then they did it again. Would you keep forgiving? And when does forgiveness all of a sudden become stupidity? Think about it. Where do you draw the line? Because I think if you cut this story uh, to the chase, I think this is what Peter's trying to figure out. Jesus, where do I draw the line when it comes to this forgiveness thing? How far do I go when it comes to this forgiveness business? And I'm sure Peter expected to, Jesus to pat him on the back because he was being so spiritual. But look what Jesus says to Peter. Jesus answered, Peter, I tell you, not seven times, but 70 times seven. What? Do the math. 490 times. You might say, hey, wait a minute. Put on the brakes. 
You mean I'm supposed to forgive somebody 490 times who's hurt me, offended me, and maybe abused me? That's a lot of sin. That's a lot of pain, and that's a lot of forgiveness. And it sure seems impossible. Amen? That's why Jesus told this parable. He launches into this story in verse 23. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven is like a king who wanted to settle accounts with his servants. As he began the settlement, a man who owed him 10,000 bags of gold. Let me stop here. That's a lot of gold. 10,000 bags of gold was brought to him. Since he was not able to pay, the master ordered that he and his wife and his children and all that he had be sold to repay the debt. At this, the servant fell on his knees before him. Be patient with me, he begged, and I will pay back everything. The servant's master took pity on him, canceled the debt, and let him go. Do you realize what's happening here in this story? What's happening is this man owed his king an enormous sum of money. That in today's terms, let's just say it was $50 million. It's a ridiculous amount of money, a ridiculous amount of debt that this man definitely couldn't pay back. So when the king demanded the money, what did this guy do? He begged for mercy. He begged to be forgiven. He even promised to pay back the money, even though he wouldn't have been able to. And in that moment, the king had a choice to make. He could have sold that man's entire family. He could have sold all of his possessions to recapture some of his cost. He could have thrown the man in jail, thrown away the key. The king realized there was still a price that needed to be paid. There was still a debt that needed to be paid, so he, get this part, he, not the servant, decided to take on the pain of that financial shortfall, that debt. He took the financial hit. And basically he's saying, I know that you owe, but I'm going to pay. You owe, but I'll pay. And just like that, he cleaned that guy's slate. He wiped the slate, the uh, debt clean. So it brings me to my first point. If you're taking notes, we forgive because God first forgave us. We can forgive because God first forgave us. Do you realize this is actually the whole gospel preached in a couple of verses? Our, our sin definitely hurt God. And we owed him a sin debt that was astronomical, so astronomical it couldn't be paid. So that's why Jesus went to the cross. The G, this cross was Jesus' way of saying, hey, you don't owe me anymore. You're free. You're set free. Because of my mercy, my grace, and my forgiveness have had the last word. Your debt's been canceled. Praise God. Our debt's been canceled. And here's the kicker. You and I have to forgive. You and I have got to forgive others because Jesus has forgiven us. And get this part. Because you are now a forgiven person, you have to be a forgiving person. Because you are now a forgiven person through the blood of Jesus Christ, you have to be a forgiving person. Forgiven people forgive people. Forgiven people forgive others. The truth is forgiveness is not an optional part of a Christian's life. It's not at all. It's a necessary part of what it means to be a Christian. So if we're going to follow Jesus, guess what? We have to forgive. We have to forgive. We have no other choice. It's our duty, you might say. But the only way you're going to have the power to forgive is to remember what Jesus has done for you. Is to remember what Jesus has forgiven you of. And we have to forgive, the Bible says, as God has forgiven us. How did he forgive us? Freely, completely, graciously, full of mercy, and totally. The miracle that you and I have received of forgiveness is something that we aren't to keep for ourselves. It's something that we need to pass on to others. And understand this, I'll be the first to admit, we can't do it on our own. That's why we have to go back and look at what Jesus has already done for us. And to realize the strength that I need to forgive so-and-so is only going to come from him. I don't have it within me. You don't have it within you. We can't do it on our own. But with God's help, we can. not Look what it says in verse 28. But when that servant went out, this servant is the one that was forgiven that debt of 10,000 bags of gold. When that servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred silver coins. Let me stop here. Because this is a minute amount of money. I mean, it's so small, like $10 or $20. I'm thinking he had to probably, he wanted to take his wife out to McDonald's. Uh, McRib was back. He wanted to get her a nice meal. And he just forgot to pay it back. It's a small amount. But look what this guy does. He grabbed him and began to choke him. So he's got this guy by the neck. Pay back what you owe me, he demanded. His fellow servant fell to his knees and begged him, be patient with me and I will pay it back. But he refused. 
Instead, he went off and had the man thrown into prison until he could pay the debt. With the other servant, when the other servants saw what had happened, they probably filmed it with their phones, put it out there on Facebook. They were outraged and went and told their master everything that had happened. Then the master called the servant in. You wicked servant, he said. I canceled all that debt of yours because you begged me to. Shouldn't you have had mercy on your fellow servant just as I had on you? In anger, his master handed him over to the jailers to be tortured. Other translations said he turned him over to the tormentors to be tortured until he should pay back all he owed. So you get the picture here? This man who had been forgiven such an enormous amount sees a guy along the streets that owes him a minimal amount. And when this guy couldn't pay, he has him thrown into jail. When the people hear about it, they tell the master. The master gets angry. The, man throws, the master throws this man in jail to be tortured until he can pay back the amount that was previously forgiven. You know, I just caught this as I was studying this text. You know what he had? To, that that 10,000 bags of gold debt was piled right back on him. He had to go right back to, day, to moment one. He had all of that. He lost all of that forgiveness is what I'm trying to say. The second thing this story does, it shows us our hypocrisy when we don't forgive others. You know you're a hypocrite when you don't forgive others. Shouldn't that guy that got forgiven such a great debt forgiven the other guy, the little debt? Shouldn't he? I mean, the answer is definitely yes. And I think Jesus kind of puts a mirror in our face here to really show us the absurdity when we're not willing to forgive trifling debts that others may owe us. And the amount that was owed by the second, second guy was not much. Ten to twenty dollars. Think of the utter hypocrisy of this guy refusing to forgive the guy that owed him ten or twenty dollars when he was forgiven the debt of ten thousand bags of gold. There's a real debt here in the story for sure, but I think the point Jesus is making is that no matter how bad a person treats you, no matter how much they've hurt you, no matter how much they've violated you, it's nothing compared to the debt that you and I owe God. It's nothing compared to the debt that we owe God. I think the best incentive to forgive is to remember what you've been forgiven of. That's the best incentive. Think of how many sins that He's covered for us. Think about it. Think about all the punishment that we haven't had to receive because of His grace. Amen? It's been because of His grace. In fact, in Luke chapter 7, verse 47, Jesus says, He who has been forgiven little, loves little. Do you realize our willingness to forgive is in direct proportion to our remembrance of how much you and I have been forgiven of? That's something important to remember. Absolutely. In this parable, we are like the unforgiving servants. We may not want to face that, but we're like the unforgiving servants because we're standing before God with our sins piled up like a mountain. A mountain that's so high we can't get over it. A mountain that's so deep you can't get under it. It's a mountain so wide you can't get around it. And that's not just me today. That's every one of us in this room. That's just everyone in this world. Do you realize our sins are like a gazillion dollar debt? A gazillion dollar debt that we could never pay in a whole lifetime. Actually, we could never pay it, pay it in a thousand lifetimes. But God, who is rich in mercy, the Bible says, says, I'll forgive all your sins. We didn't deserve it, but he says, I'll forgive all your sins. My son's going to go to the cross to pay your sin debt, so you owe me nothing. Think about the blessing in that, that we owed him everything. And I think he used that 10,000 bags of gold for a reason, to help us to realize in the end that our debt to him was a whole lot more than 10,000 bags of gold. It was everything. But going back to the Scripture, what kind of torture was he actually talking about? I think he's actually talking about that inner torment that comes when we decide we're going to hold a grudge against somebody when we're going to throw all this hatefulness out to somebody. And that, torture can, uh, that kind of torture can definitely steal your joy. And it can definitely steal your peace. Some of, some of you are experiencing that right now. Some of you felt that a week ago. But it can steal your joy and your peace. Refusing to forgive someone will make you a very unhappy person. Do you realize that? Refusing to forgive someone, it'll make you a bitter person. It'll make you an angry person, an unloving person, and it'll make you a joyless person. So when you choose not to forgive, do you know you're the one who suffers? You, the other person's not suffering as much as you're going to suffer. You may not be able to forget it, but hear me out on this. You can forgive it. 
with God's help. You may not be able to forget it. That's a harder part of it. But with God's help, God's strength, God's power, you can forgive it. So if you're a Christian, just like this girl I mentioned earlier in the story, Melissa Jenkins, you have to find a way to forgive. We have to find a way to forgive. In fact, not forgiving someone, it's an outright sin. The Bible calls it an outright sin because if you don't forgive a person who's done you wrong and sinned against you, then you're actually sinning against God. You may not want to see that, but that's the truth. And you can't say you're a Christ follower if you don't forgive. And I'll say this, you can't expect to be forgiven if you don't forgive. That's biblical. That's scriptural. So the question is, how do we forgive? And it's not by you and me doing anything to be more forgiving. We aren't good enough. Christianity never started with us being good enough. It starts with God being good enough. Amen? We have to start by totally focusing on the enormous debt that he paid for us. The enormous debt that he forgave us. So I'll just say this today. If you're having trouble forgiving someone, I want you to remember what Jesus Christ has done for you. Think about it. What has Jesus Christ done for you? Let me walk you through it. Remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Remember when he was all alone and he had his disciples over sleeping in the corner? He was all by himself uh, praying and bleeding uh, uh, drops of blood and sweat. Such an intense moment. Can you imagine those soldiers showing up with their lanterns and their clubs and beating him and whipping him? Listen to all the false witnesses that came out of the woodwork to bear false witness, to lie about Jesus, and he didn't even say a word. Feel the pain of the whip that was laid on his back. Feel the pain of that crown of thorns crushed on his head. And walk with Jesus as he walked out of that city of Jerusalem with that cross on his back and headed up Calvary's hill to a place called Golgotha. And then listen and feel the agonizing pain as he has his hands and his feet nailed to the cross. And imagine that spear being thrust into his side. And then listen. As Jesus hangs dying on the cross and in his final moments, what did he say? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. And when you imagine all of that that Jesus has done for you, can you take a moment and realize then I should forgive? Then I should forgive because of all that Jesus has done for me. As I prepare to close, I know one thing about most all of us. When somebody wrongs us, we keep record of that wrong. We lock it away in our hearts and our minds. And then when that day comes and they offend us again, then all of a sudden we think we can justify the unforgiveness. Thought about it. It's kind of like having an unforgiveness IOU. How many IOUs do you have in your heart today? How many unforgiveness IOUs? I want you to picture all those names of all the people who have hurt you, offended you, abused you, mistreated you. And I want you to imagine all those names on a piece of paper. And on the top of that piece of paper, it's written, Unforgiveness IOUs. And you might as well go ahead and put my name at the top of that list. Because sooner or later, unintentionally, but sooner or later, I'm going to offend you. Maybe I already have. So start with my name. But then put your name, the name of your parents, the name of your closest friends, your spouse, your children, your boss, whoever. Put them down because sooner or later you're, all, you're going to be hurt and offended by all of them some way, somehow. But look what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 4, 32. And be kind to one another, tenderhearted. And this is the kicker. Forgiving one another just as God and Christ also forgave you. Forgive one another as Christ forgave us. Think about how he forgave us. I didn't deserve one ounce of forgiveness when he gave it. All I had to do is say, I need it. All I had to say, Jesus, thank you. I receive it. Now I want you to imagine tearing up that list of names. Because you realize forgiveness is tearing up that list. Forgiveness is tearing that list. And when you are willing to do that, guess what? God can set you free. You're never more like Jesus than when you forgive one another. Somebody said this one time, we, like, we are like beasts when we kill. We are like men when we judge. And we are like God when we forgive. 
you know, he who's been forgiven little loves little. You know, in my mind, in my heart, I always turned that around. For me, and I said, he who's been forgiven much loves much. I think of what God has done for me in my life. I think about his mercy and his grace and my undeserved favor that he has given me. He who has been forgiven much, and I know the mountain of sin that I've got had in my life. And he forgave it. He wiped it out. He's no respecter of persons. He did it for me. He wants to do it for you. And I've said it many times. I was the last person you would have thought that he would have called into ministry. I fought him and I fought him. And I kept reminding him of this long list of sins and failures. But you know what about my God? When he forgives you, he wipes the slate clean. It's almost like he was saying, what are you talking about? That was already gone because I had repented of it. It was me that was bringing it back. He had thrown it into, as the Bible says, the sea of forgiveness. Forgetfulness. Threw it over his shoulder. It was gone. All I'm saying is I love my Jesus so much because he forgave me of so much. And I just want to say today, he loves you just as much as he does me. He loves you. He paid a price for you. He's no respecter of person. So if he did it for me, he wants to do it for you today. If you don't know him today, he wants you to know him. As I close, I want to ask you, do you know him? Could you stand to your feet? Have you experienced his grace, his mercy, and his love? Have you confessed your sins over to him and received his forgiveness, his cleansing power? And have you claimed his son, Jesus Christ, as your Lord and your Savior? And if not, I hope you do it right now as I'm praying. I hope you just open up your heart and invite Jesus to come in. It's that simple. To say, Jesus, I've heard your word. I'm responding to your word. I need you to be my Lord and my Savior. Come into my heart. Could you bow your heart in prayer? Father God, help us to do what we can't do on our own. Help us to choose to forgive those who have hurt us or offended us or abused us. And help us to be able to do that by remembering what you've already done for us. You forgave us when we didn't deserve one ounce of forgiveness. Help us to tear up all those IOUs that we've been holding on to. And help us to forgive them and release them over to you. Father, I ask that you would change our hearts. That's the only thing that can do it. Change our hearts and help us to walk in your forgiveness. And Father, if there's anyone here today that doesn't know you, that hasn't experienced your grace and mercy, I pray that even right now as I'm praying, they'll just say, Lord Jesus, I open my heart. I want to receive you to be my Lord and Savior. I believe you went to that cross to die for me, shed your blood for me so that I could be forgiven. And just accept him as your Lord and your personal Savior right now. Father, I thank you for your grace and your mercy. I thank you for your love. And I thank you for this parable that shows us, Lord God, one extreme to the other. Shows us uh, how we can be forgiven of so much and not appreciate it. But I pray as today we leave here, we'll see everything differently. We'll appreciate your forgiveness. We'll appreciate your love and your mercy like never before. And we won't just appreciate it. We'll share it with the world around us. We give you praise, glory, and honor in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. God bless you all. Have a wonderful week.